Praise to Yahoo Elohim. What up, y'all? It's your boy Pat Gray, K.A. Prez. Y'all for the Rumble Room. And uh, today I just want to discuss uh, <clears throat> a few things um, regarding uh, why is it's important to um, be able to defend the captivity narrative in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. <clears throat> for those that may be... Uh, I'm familiar with those chapters. Um, Daniel chapter two is where you find the um, Daniel's image. This is the uh, statue with uh, the golden head, the <clears throat> arms of silver, the um, the torso of brass, and um, the legs of iron uh, that descend into clay at the toes. Um, and how this, this image st stands for the four captivities. Okay. We're talking about Babylon, talking about Persia, Medes, talking about Greece, talking about, um, Rome <clears throat> and how this, how this four captivity narrative in Daniel chapter two course corresponds with the four beast uh imagery in daniel chapter seven okay i recently had a discussion on debate talk for you um shout out to debate talk for you um <clears throat> and i spoke with a brother named amayan uh i'll uh i will show the <clears throat> okay Show the uh, thumbnail of what that what that uh, conversation looked like. You can find this on the Rumble Room channel for those who wish to um, access the discussion that was had. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into this real quick. I just want to um, say that a lot of the stuff that I was discussing was pulled from this this discussion okay which you can find on the rebel room channel okay <clears throat> and uh one second let me see if there's anything else yeah okay <clears throat> so this was this was the discussion that i was having um this was the the discussion uh where i was dis uh i was uh debating with the brother about the correspondence of the imagery in Daniel chapter 2 to Daniel chapter 7, okay? This brother argued that, <clears throat> he argued that the, the narrative in chapter 2 doesn't correspond with the narrative in chapter 7, okay? <clears throat> he also believes that um, we are out of the Roman captivity, so my primary goal was to to argue that there is correspondence between the imagery in Daniel chapter 2 with Daniel chapter 7. We also discussed um, being in the current captivity Rome. Obviously, the discussion naturally led to that because in order to in, in order to prove that we're that the fourth captivity is the Roman captivity, I would have to, involved in that, I, I would venture to prove that we were still under the Roman captivity. The brother naturally challenged me on that, and he should have. Um, and uh, so I had to prove that Rome 
was still in uh, an empire in power. Now, that led to a few different places. We ended up discussing um, classic Roman Empire. We ended up, ended up discussing Byzantium, Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. And we also ended up discussing the, the Ottoman Turks. Okay, we ended up discussing the Ottoman Turks. And the Ottoman Turks were, were Muslim. <clears throat> now, because like I learned about this, like I learned about this stuff a while back, um, and I don't really get into the history a lot because I never really, honestly, I never really imagined that I would have to defend it uh, against the Hebrew. Um, but lo and behold, uh, you know, the challenge presented itself, and um, the waters, the waters got deep. Waters got deep because. You know, he, he challenged me, and I and I and I welcome the challenge. You know, it's it's, it's each challenge kind of shows you where your limits are, and it sort of calls you to be better. So, um, you know, once you get into the history of the Byzantine Empire, things start to become clear. Like clearly, the Byzantine Empire was still part of Rome. Um, and I'd like to correct some information that I may have um, some misinformation that I give. I said that. Um, the Byzantine Empire didn't have a Roman Empire, and I be, and, and it did. It, uh, I think Constantine the Eleventh was the last emperor, um, but I was more focused on showing that the Pope had a lot of power, um, um, and so um, I think I said that I believe I said um, Byzantine didn't have an empire, but indeed it did, and it was Constantine the Eleventh. Uh, I believe, and and if I'm wrong about that, if I recall correctly, that's 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 who the guy was. If I'm wrong, please um, do the due diligence, and um, <clears throat> I'll be happy to correct that. Uh, but Byzantine uh, faced the threat of the Ottoman Turks, who were Muslims. Now he said, "Well, what does an what does an Ottoman Turk have to do with Rome?" Okay, and so. I began to um, um, make the connections that there uh, make the claim that there is still ties. There, there was ties from Islam to Rome. It's just not very, very um, immediate. Um, and there is a gentleman who has made the ties to Rome, and I'm going to share that resource in a minute. Um, but one thing I told, one thing I brought into the, introduced to the discussion was that at some level, um, at a certain level, there are families, there are very elite royal families vying for possession of land, vying for infamy. Now we never see that. We never see that at, at our level because this is a, at a level of, <clears throat> you know, wealth and power, most of us just do not have access to. Um, and so it's difficult to make that connection to somebody who doesn't, who may not acknowledge it. I'm not sure if the brother Amayan acknowledges that there is an elite power structure. You know, if, if you don't believe in Freemasonry, if you don't believe that Freemasons have a lodge on every continent and at, at some level, Christian Freemasons and Muslim Freemasons and Buddhist Freemasons or, you know, they, at some level, they don't really acknowledge the distinction between their religions. It's really kind of a free Masonic religion and it gets very Luciferian. It's almost like a universal religion. All right. Now, <clears throat> there's a gentleman who did his due diligence, and his name is Walter Veith. It's this gentleman right here. <clears throat> uh, from my understanding, from my, my impression, this guy is a, a Christian. Um, and so going straight into it, I knew that he didn't, ha he didn't have the whole story. All right. Um, but his vehemence, he was sort of fueled to sort of defend his understanding of um, evangelical Christianity against um, Roman Catholicism, okay? And so what he, what he uh, 
ventured to do, what he um, set out to do was show that behind all of, well, at least behind um, Islam is Rome. Okay. And so, uh, so in this video, um, his man goes to set up the connection between Islam and Rome. And he does a very remarkable job, very thorough job at doing this. Um, and he uses document history, historical documents, and he also uses the esoteric writings of the of the Freemasons and others. I think he mentions he pulls a lot from um, Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma, and he goes into uh, um, the writings of Adam uh, Madame Blavatsky. Okay, and these individuals are sh are speaking on the pagan, the mystery religions, and how they coincide with with co Christianity, various elements in Christianity, various elements in Islam, um, <clears throat> mainly how the the sun worship, the I Osiris and Isis, the Astarte, Ashtaroth worship is present within Christianity from Rome to the Byzantine Empire um, to the into the into uh, the Islamic religion. He points out the symbolism, how the sun and the crescent and the star uh, is really sort of it goes back to Isis, Osiris um, worship. Um, he points out the um, the symbolism in Byzantium, that little P with the X, and how sometimes you'll you'll find it um, over a boat, um, and this is just sort of reissued um, Iris Osiris uh, paganism, the sun in the in the womb, the sun uh, uh, nestled inside the crescent. Okay. <clears throat> These are themes you can find in all of the world religions. So his 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 um his sort of starting point is that um behind the facade of all of the major religions there are um there is um sort of soft in there are, they serve as soft entry points into Freemasonry. <clears throat> so they so in your Christian religions and your churches, you have Christians and then you have Christians who aren't so Christian. All right. So in every in likewise, in every mosque, you have Islam, um, Muslims, you have imams that are that are Muslims. And then you have Muslims that aren't so Muslim. Right. And so as you sort of are pulled in within to the power structure, you learn that, that you're no longer, you know, the, 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 the Bible kind of fades away. The, 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 the Quran sort of fades away and you sort of venture into other documents it, and, and it becomes Luciferian. Okay. So if, if you have trouble uh, believing that there is a, an elite power structure um, an Illuminati or deep state or whatever you want to call it, um, then you're going to have trouble with this. But if you if you understand that there is um, an elite power structure that is you know that lies you know underneath the facade of you know of society, then then you're primed for what he has to say. <clears throat> now he um, so like I said before, his the really the kind of the meat of, of this lecture, really uh, what's special about it, what's relevant to to the discussion is that he makes the connection between Islam and Rome. Um, <clears throat> and so let me see where else I want to go. Um, this will answer questions. This will sort of um, equip you with information to defend that Rome is still in power. So when the Ottoman Turks when the Ottoman Turks took over, when they when they sort of um, took over um, Byzantium and Turkey in that weird area, um, that strange area between Turkey and Greece, the eastern part of Greece, um, Islam took over. Now, what does that have to do with with Rome? Well, 
when you understand that Islam came out of Rome, it came out of, um, you know, he makes the connection to Fatima, to, Fat to Fatima, which is, which was, um, uh, I believe it was Muhammad's wife. Okay. It was Muhammad's wife. And, and she sort of gave him the way he tells it, Walter V. Um, she gave him the sort of the palatable um, form of Catholicism that Arabs would 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 readily accept, because there was this idea that there were genuine um, Christ followers, possibly even Torah. I don't think he had. I don't think he mentions Torah, but I believe that there are still Torah believers, just as Acts says, right? Like those who um, are zealous for the law, but um, believe on the Messiah, they had to receive a, 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 a form of religion that, you know, they wouldn't accept Roman Catholicism. So this Islam was sort of their version of Catholicism. And he points out that, um, he points out the similarities, the beads um, the ritualistic form of worship, um, the mosque sort of cathedral kind of parallel, and how there are shrines even within the mosques, just like there are within the cathedrals. Um, <clears throat> and so, and so, um, so there are various um, ties that he makes. It's very interesting lectures, an hour and a half, if you, you know, it's gonna, you know, it's, 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 it's going to take some time, but it's, I mean, it's like watching a movie, but it's well worth it. You know, it's not a 30, it's not a 30 minute, 15 minute video, but it, <clears throat> he does a very extensive job and he does a good job. So it's, it's I believe it's well worth the invested time. <clears throat> um, but just to, um, just to touch on this, uh, a quick little uh, side note about this Fatima, this Fatima. Um, so <clears throat> the Catholic churches... I think Fatima. There's a there's a maybe a city in Portugal that is named after it. Maybe it was in tribute to the real Fatima. <clears throat> but I can I can say for sure that this Fatima is a real thing. Like in Portugal, um, when I was in when I was in Brazil, um, I stayed about. A, I've been to Brazil a few times, but the first time I went, um, I stayed a month, um, and I was taking language lessons. Um, it was during the summer, uh, and I stayed in this one neighborhood and my bus route that ran into the subway station, um, on the way to, you know, so I can go to, to the school, there was a church, there was a church on the bus route. <clears throat> it was a Catholic church. And this church was uh, in, 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 in Portuguese, in Portuguese, it said, Our Lady Fatima. Now, me being from America, I thought that was very strange because I know that Fat Fatima, Fatima is an Arabic name. I said, what does, what is an Arabic name? What does an Arabic Fatima have to do with the um, Latin Roman Catholic Church? And I never forgot that. I was expecting to see something like Miriam or Maria, you know, but, I, but, but it said Fatima, no Saddam, Fatima. All right. And um, and so I, I never forgot that until um, I came across this video uh, a couple years back. I just never watched the whole thing. And the um, discussion I had with the brother Amayan on Debate Talk for You, it really prompted me to go back and sort of um, listen to what this gentleman had to say. Um now, some may ask, why, why is it important? Why is it important to be able to defend that Rome is still holding us captive? Why is it important to defend the, Rome, the four captivity narrative in Daniel 2 and 7? Well, it shows that we understand properly the, the, Daniel, the, the four captivity narrative in Daniel 2 and chapter 7. Um, history already speaks that Israel has gone through the Babylonian captivity, the Persian Mede uh, captivity, and then the Greek captivity. We know that um, if we were reading the New Testament narrative, we know that 
um, um, 63 BC, General Pompey took over Israel and Israel became a province of Rome. And by the time that uh, the Messiah was born, Rome was in power. It was, uh, it, it was occupying Israel. Now, the guile of, of Christianity, right, is that pastors, Christian pastors across the nation have convinced um, parishioners, have convinced churchgoers that, um, that the Messiah didn't come, he didn't really come to liberate Israel from their physical captivity from Rome. He really came to establish a spiritual kingdom. That's what, that's, what, that's what Christian pastors say. But if we read Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10, if we read uh, Luke 1, 67 through 75, we know that Israel was supposed to, was destined to be an autonomous nation in the end. And we know that in the New Testament, John the Baptist's father prophesied a physical liberation from Rome by the by the hand of the by the leadership of the Messiah. Okay, <clears throat> and if you really want to see some Christians hightail it, really, you can really head them off at the pass with this discussion of the four captivity narrative because they've they can only tread water so long as um there is no liberation expected from Rome Christians will try to will they'll try to shift the focus of the discussion they will try to avoid answering and reconciling uh reconciling this narrative to to biblical history, this prophecy to biblical history. You ask a Christian, if, you know, why, why was, why was, how is Israel, um, let me see, how does this go? You know, if, 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 so we know that Israel is supposed to be liberated after Rome and after, and according to the Daniel prophecy. After Rome, after the fourth kingdom is toppled, then that that signals the restoration of of Israel as a nation. And we know that Israel was promised to be an autonomous nation. We know that there by prophecy there are, they were promised to be liberated. Now, in Acts one through six, we have the disciples asking. The Messiah, if he's going to restore the kingdom, but the Messiah does not restore the kingdom. Okay, he he ascends, and some decades later, about almost four, just shy of forty years, General Vespasian of the Roman army, he come, he leads the Roman army into Jerusalem, and he he raises the temple to the ground. Now the temple is gone. So no longer are sacred done, okay? The Levitical order is not able to fulfill its duties. And as far as worship goes, proper worship to Yahuwah Elohim, it's hobbled, okay? Now, not only does that happen, but Israelites are massacred and many flee, okay? <clears throat> so how, so the Christian is faced with asking, how is prophecy fulfilled then okay we know that we're under roman captivity still because the fourth kingdom has not been toppled now according to the fourth captivity narrative we have babylon captivity which passed persia median captivity which passed and we have greek captivity which passed so all so the next the last captivity that we know was for, that was for sure lording it over over the Israel nation was Rome. So that has to be the fourth captivity. It has to be the fourth captivity. All right. Now we know Rome as an empire eventually sort of it it changed faces. It changed. Rome 
West Rome ended up splitting. There was a Western Roman Empire, and then there ended up being an Eastern Roman Empire, which was called Byzantine or Byzantium. Okay, and after Byzantium came the Ottoman Turks, who were Muslims. All right. Now, when it comes to when when they start to ask, what does a Muslim have to do with Rome? You can look to this video here, and this will give you the proper narrative. Okay. This will give you the information needed to prove that, hey, there are still, there are connections from Islam to Rome, which really sort of kind of uh, quell the, the contention um, when someone asks, what does Islam have to do with Rome? Okay. This guy will give you all the information you need. And, and you can also point to other things that of how all the leaders of the world and even religious leaders, they'll come to meet the Pope and how the Pope, how Rome is really the spiritual center of Europe's activities. All the nations get blessings from Rome, you know, from, from, from long time. From long time, they got a, a papal bull or blessing or decree from Rome, okay? This discussion will will also give you some information as far as, as, as that. I brought up some things. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, so that will really kind of be able, equip you to be able to discuss with Christians and discuss with maybe even Hebrew naysayers. Um, again, that's t it's typically it's not it's not. Um, um, it's not typical that Hebrews don't believe that we are not under Roman captivity still, but so, but, but in case you come across some, some Hebrews that'll throw you a curveball, like, like this gentleman did, his name is Amayan. Okay. <clears throat> you'll be able to discuss those things. <clears throat> and more importantly, you'll be able to interface with the Christians who really try to get Hebrews shift Hebrews away from that discussion because there's it's just really it becomes really difficult the waters get get really deep and really rough for them to tread <clears throat> so if you can defend that four captivity narrative you can prove that that we are you can prove where we're at in the in our captivity and how we are in the last captivity, and how even though the Roman Empire is not, there's no Caesar issuing decrees over America, or you know, we don't we don't know of a Caesar. Okay, even though um, you know all we see is a Pope, even though there was a Muslim regime that had arisen, um, and even a, an era of Islamic empire that rose up. You can still um, defend the narrative that Islam is part of Rome. Byzantine was part of Rome. Okay, it's all part of Rome. Okay, you can also look to, this isn't mentioned in this video, but you can also look, just look at how um, they really, the two uh, religions really kind of divided up land, divided up, like the way, look at how Africa is divided up. You know, it's really kind of, I mean, you have West Africa, which is, which is Catholic, but you have a lot of it is, is, is Islam. A lot of it is Muslim. The Southern half of the Mediterranean really kind of belongs to Islam and the Northern half of the Mediterranean really belongs to, uh, Catholicism. So, um, let me see, is there anything else I need to... <clears throat> I think that is all for now. Um, but um, I'll, you'll probably see some more um, posts like this in the Rumble Room. I'll probably make more posts about it. Um, if you have any questions, hit me up. Um, obviously, I'll see you guys on the threads. But, um, but I guess that's all for now. Okay? So I hope this discussion was edifying. And I will talk to you guys soon. Peace, light, and shalom.